All right. Well, good afternoon. Uh, thanks for everyone for joining us. We've now hit uh, 1,400, so we'll go ahead and kick off uh, this uh, this quarter's edition of the uh, the Cassie webinar series for ACC. So, on behalf of uh, our ACC partners, I'd like to welcome you all and thanks for joining in. Uh, we have people that are uh, still coming into the Zoom meeting. We are also streaming live on Facebook, and we have some people watching on Facebook Live. Uh, as well as on YouTube. So uh, for those of you watching, uh, please feel free to use the, uh, the Q&A features and we will get to those uh, as each of the presenters comes along uh, and, and gives those. And then uh, obviously at the end, uh, if you're on YouTube or Facebook, I will try to monitor those chats as well. Uh, so please feel free to put in comments and things like that. Uh, and uh, we are also recording this. So we will be able to, uh, after some light editing, uh, we will be able to put it up on uh, Divid's uh, as well as on our YouTube channel. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to welcome you to today's session. Uh, we are going to be focusing on the PLA Air Force. Uh, and uh, we're very delighted today to have three experts in this area, two from our very own Cassie here, and one, uh, Christina, who is a Cassie associate. She currently works at RAND uh, and was the co-author of the book that Cassie put out, which really is the definitive study of the, uh, the history of the PLA Air Force. Um, so you have their uh, you have their bios. You can see them online at any time. Uh, so I'm not going to belabor the point, but uh, needless to say, they've all been working on China for uh, for a long time uh, and have a deep wealth of experience and knowledge on it. And so uh, certainly experts in this particular topic. But if there's questions that come up, uh, kind of in a broader range, feel free to throw those in the uh, the Q, Q and A uh, as well. And we are uh, certainly more than willing to to take those on. Uh, so without further ado, uh, we're going to turn it over to Christina, and she will start us off. Uh, and there we go. Christina, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Uh, and the floor is yours. Thanks, Brendan. Um, and thanks to you and uh, ACC for inviting me to participate today. Um, uh, as Brendan mentioned, I'm a policy researcher at the RAND Corporation, and I'm just going to post a link to the um, the PLAF book that Brendan mentioned in the chat um, on uh, Zoom for those who can access that. Um, otherwise, you can just um, search uh, China Aerospace Studies Institute um, and look at the publications list. And I think a lot of the, the publications we'll be talking about um, today, uh, we'll, you can access there. Um, one other thing I should say is that um, the views today I'll, uh, I'll express today are uh, my own. Um, they're not um, views of the US uh, government or other organizations. Um, so I'd like to kick off by um, uh, sharing uh, four themes from um, some of my recent work on China's Air Force strategy um, and how the, the history of the Air Force influences um, its operations and its approach today. Um, and this is mainly coming from um, the 70 years of the People's Liberation Army Air Force book. Um, I should mention my co-author on the book is Ken Allen, who's a retired uh, US Air Force analyst, um, and he serves as the Assistant Air Attaché in DAO Beijing. Um, so the first theme I'd like to raise is about the role of the Air Force in the People's Republic of China. Um, and that's at the PLA Air Force. I'll say PLAF um, a lot <laughs> as I'm talking today. Um, the the PLAF's development and operations often constrained by domestic political, um, as well as geopolitical, operational, and other factors. Um, so while Western air doctrine um, has emphasized Air Force's speed, um, their independence, and their def decisive case of capability during a conflict, that has not been true for most of the PLAF's existence. Um, so why hasn't the PLAF had this uh, independent role? Um, there's two main reasons. So first, um, the PLA has historically been very ground-centric. Um, when it was first founded and even before um, uh, its official founding in 1949, when the People's Republic of China was established, um, the uh, goal for developing the Air Force's capability was to be, quote unquote, on a foundation of the ground forces. That was the guiding principle. Um, second is the PLAF's history and experience. So particularly from 1960 to 1989, um, there were uh, three major um, events and issues, the Sino-Soviet split, um, the Cultural Revolution, and the political tarnishing of PLA Air Force leaders. And these ushered in a dark age for the PLAF. Um, so PLAF operations are often restricted uh, to control escalation um, due to concerns about the PLAF's political reliability, and also due to atrophied capability um, of Air Force units during the Cultural Revolution. Um, so when did that all start changing? Well, we see PLAF leaders and strategists start to advocate for a more independent um, and active PLAF role within the PLA in about the 1980s, late 1980s. Um, but this didn't receive formal senior leadership buy-in until about 2004. 
Um, and in 2004, we see China's military high command, which is called the Central Military Commission, um, endorse the Air Force's first service-specific strategic concept. Um, and this is now known as the strategic Air Force concept. Um, so to sum up, if we think about the PLAF as a roughly 70-year-old organization and culture, um, it's basically in the past 15 years, since 2004, that it's been adopting a similar strategic approach to other capable and sophisticated air forces. Um, so this might lead um, some listeners to ask, what does all this historical context mean for Air Force operations today? Um, so that leads me to my second theme I want to highlight, um, is that um, the PLAF, especially the aviation branch, um, by which I mean fixed wing aircraft, has very little combat experience and essentially none since 1958. Um, so to give a really brief summary, um, before 1949, um, which was uh, in the 40s, a civil war between Chinese communists and national forces, um, the PLA didn't field many aircraft. And this is largely because it couldn't sustain them um, or maintain air fields um, as well as aircraft themselves. And also because PLA forces, as I mentioned, they were very infantry centric during this time. Um, air forces weren't a key focus um, of the campaigns during that period. So the PLA did field significant quantities of aircraft in conflict during the Korean War. Um, but there was, uh, despite some guidance to the PLAF to provide direct support to PLA ground forces, we saw that large air packages that attempted to support the ground troops were severely damaged. Um, also, the US Far East Air Forces repeatedly bombed Chinese airfields that were set up in North Korea. Um, so the PLAF wasn't able to employ them and pretty short operational ranges of Chinese aircraft at the time meant that really um, hampered their, their efforts during the war. Um, so following a central military um, commission assessment that the PLAF was not capable of providing direct support during the war, um, the PLAF's mission was actually changed in late 1951. And the mission was to provide indirect support to ground forces by protecting supply lines and military targets, um, as well as commanding the air over Northwestern Korea. So certainly um, during that war, the PLAF learned a lot about contemporary air operations, but some sources indicate that PLA didn't view Chinese air power strategically decisive in the war. Um, I'll zoom forward in history. So to give a brief overview of developments in and near the Taiwan Strait, air defense over mainland China, vis-a-vis um, -vis the Republic of China Nationalist Forces, uh, took a number of decades for the PLAF to achieve. It was only largely in the 1990s that the PLAF began pushing out into the Taiwan Strait um, in a significant way. Um, so PLAF aviators' most recent large-scale direct combat experience is during the 1958 Second Taiwan Strait Crisis. So this, um, during this crisis, there was an attempt by the PLA to dislodge um, nationalist forces from Jimen and Mazu. And these are two island group, groups held by Taiwan that are very close, only 10 to 20 kilometers from the Chinese mainland. Um, but what happened was that the PLAF was unsuccessful in gaining enough command of the air to help the ground forces take the islands. Um, and PLAF aircraft were also outmatched by new Republic of China aircraft, um, as well as missiles provided by the United States. Um, so this led to unfavorable exchange ratios. Um, overall, PLA Air Force aircraft haven't participated much in China's conflicts. So that includes the 1962 Sino-Indian War, um, the Vietnam War against the United States, um, the 1969 border conflict with the Soviet Union, um, as well as the PLA short invasion of Vietnam in 1979. The bottom line of all this history is that the PLAF's combat operations are very limited. Um, and that, that's been the case due to political distrust, limited operational capability, um, and some of the other factors I mentioned. So when we think about some of the questions we have uh, um, and caveats we keep in mind about the PLA's lack of combat experience since 1979, 1979 excuse me, um, uh, some of these uh, dynamics are even um, more salient and relevant for the PLAF, which hasn't had combat experience um, since 58. Um, so this gets to my third theme, um, moving more into contemporary history, um, which is what does the strategic Air Force concept from 2004 actually mean? Um, and why is it significant? Um, so a key thing to note um, is that through the 1980s, the PLAF's main role was to conduct some form of territorial air defense. Um, but as Communist Party leaders um, and PLA leaders grew to recognize the importance of air power for modern war fighting, um, in part by observing um, uh, the US and other um, leading uh, militaries and air forces um, during uh, modern wars, um, the need for China's air forces to operate offensively, independently, and beyond China's borders um, necessitated an evolution of the PLAF strategy, um, as well as its broader role within the PLA. Um, so that's why the strategic Air Force concept is significant, um, and it's in two ways. So first, this concept signified Air Force would increase its offensive capabilities. 
Um, so it's broadening its roles of responsibilities beyond that historical role of territorial air defense. And second, um, the concept flowed from recognition that the traditional dominance of the ground forces within the PLA was insufficient for fighting and winning, winning modern wars. Um, to address those types of challenges, air power would need to operate decisively, um, including both in an independent as well as a joint context. Um, so there's a specific slogan for this concept, um, uh, and it's known as integrated air and space capabilities and coordinated offensive and defensive operations. And what this means is that the PLAF is to conduct independent or coordinated strikes with other services, and these include long-range precision strikes. And it's also to defend China from long-range threats, leveraging both aircraft and ground-based air defenses. And I should note that long-range um, uh, strategic surface-to-air missile forces, um, sometimes called double-digit stands, are largely within the PLA Air Force um, inventories, um, which is you know, a little bit different from the organizational structure of the US Armed Forces, for example. Um, I'll, you'll also have noticed when I mentioned that concept earlier, integrated air and space capabilities and coordinated offensive and defensive operations um, that space is mentioned. Um, the PLAF made a bid for, but ultimately didn't succeed in gaining authority over the, the space mission within the PLA. Um, that went to a different part of the PLA called the Strategic Support Force. But the PLAF's use of space-based systems and assets does continue to grow. Um, and that's given the PLA wide focus on um, harnessing, um, increasing amounts and and qualities uh, of um, quality of information. Um, and the purpose is both to um, fight and conduct its own operations, but also to deny information to adversaries. Um, so as part of this uh, strategic air force concept, I mentioned the PLAF is expected to perform um, what some um, key PLA texts talk about as five strategic tasks. So the first is to participate in what's called the primary strategic direction. Um, most Western assessments take this to mean um, involving um, potential contingencies with regard to Taiwan. The second is to conduct homeland air defense. That's that territorial, territorial um, air defense mission um, that the PLAF has historically had. The third is to safeguard um, China's border and maritime um, quote unquote rights and interests. Um, um, so some PLAF capabilities and units um, support um, uh, defense of China's um, uh, what, what China views as legitimate um, uh, territorial and, and sovereignty interests, including in disputed areas like the South China Sea, um, and you know what Western scholars term as carrying out gray zone operations. The fourth is um, for the PLAF is to conduct emergency and disaster relief operations, um, and uh, this includes at home as well. Um, so the PLAF is supposed to assist with maintaining domestic stability um, and conducting um, operations within China's borders. And you can see an example when um, the PLA Air Force sent some of its new newest aircraft, um, transport aircraft to Wuhan in early 2020 um, to carry out some COVID relief efforts. Um, and the last mission is to conduct foreign exchanges, which the PLAF does as part of broader military diplomacy efforts. Uh, so to sum all that up, the Strategic Air Force isn't supposed to be capable of just defending China's airspace anymore. Um, this concept um, means that China is supposed to take the fight to to its opponents, or the PLAF is supposed to take the fight to China's opponents. And the PLAF units are supposed to carry out a wide array of strategic tasks. These are high-end operations during conflict, but also gray zone activities, burnishing China's um, domestic legitimacy at home, and also promoting the PLA's image abroad. Um, the last uh, area I wanted to talk about is that the future seems likely to produce a lot of um, milestones for the PLAF. Certainly, as equipment modernization continues, operations become more complex, um, and we learn more about new types of training and other activities. But there are some caveats we should keep in mind. Um, uh, so many of the listeners may recall that General Secretary Xi Jinping um, has talked about the PLA becoming a quote unquote world class military by the middle of the century. And the PLAF also has the requirement to become a quote unquote world class air force. Um, and we don't know. Um, specifics of this, this concept, they haven't been publicly stated, um, but we certainly see the PLAF improving its training, talent management, and other systems to carry out these more sophisticated missions and roles as part of strategic air force. And that includes um, long range precision strikes as well. Another area of recent developments um, in the PLAF's, uh, includes the PLAF's newly reassigned nuclear mission. And um, US de the US Department of Defense has identified this is likely carried out by a modified legacy bomber, as well as um, air launch ballistic missiles under development. And one of these missiles um, may include a nuclear capability. But what we don't see is high level PLA documents talking about this role 
uh, nor the PLA's emerging nuclear triad of land, sea, and air nuclear capabilities. Of course, force modernization efforts are underway. So China's newest fighter aircraft, the J-20, is entering inventory while older aircraft like um, the J-7 variants are leaving the force. A couple other things to mention, we should also expect overwater operations to continue to grow. Um, PLAF leadership has advocated for a greater maritime role to support the PLA's increased focus on the maritime direction since 2014. Uh, certainly some of these operations include the increasing number of sorties uh, near and around Taiwan, for example. And we may see a more international PLAF. Um, the PLAF could operate in the future as part of some formal um, basing presence overseas, like China's first base in Djibouti, or potentially leveraging access agreements with host nations. Finally, I'll flag some caveats. Um, as, and the first one is that as folks who um, have uh, been exposed to Chinese strategy and planning documents in the past, they tend to set ambitious targets um, that may or may not be realized. Um, so um, one thing to watch is um, when PLA leaders and PLAF um, discussions uh, finally judge that China has achieved the strategic air force concept. Um, every J Chinese defense white paper since 2004 has talked about accelerating to achieve this milestone, um, but it's not clear yet that um, the PLAF feels it um, has truly developed this op offensive capability um, and, and modernized to this extent. Um, a second caveat is we might we should have some caution reg regarding evolving PLA concepts of operation. Um, I mentioned 1958 is the most recent combat experience for PLAF aviators. Um, so um, continuing to focus on and learn more about PLA thinking on how the PLAF may be called on to operate in the Western Pacific is really important. Um, there would certainly be lots of operational stresses and strains. Um, the PLAF air crews, as well as maintenance and logistics uh, units and other elements of the Air Force um, would need to work on um, to address. Um, it's really important to understand those topics better, although it presents a lot of research challenges for um, you know, folks on the call um, uh, uh, to, to continue to understand better. Um, and then um, final thoughts, um, uh, China Aerospace Studies Institute researcher Marcus Clay has talked about detailed challenges in PLAF personnel structure and policies. Um, and a second area it identifies the role of the women in the PLAF. So a growing body of research talks about the value of harnessing diverse talent for societies as well as militaries. And how do these different life experiences and perspectives translate to operational advantage? Um, but so far we don't see the PLAF moving in that direction. Um, when Ken and I crunched the numbers for our book, fewer than 1.1% of pilots the PLAF recruited between 1987 and 2018 were women. Um, some of the trends are improving in how the PLAF is integrating women into operational units. Overall, the number of women pilots recruited um, is, is very small and continues to be so. Um, so with that, I've raised a number of diverse topics. Uh, thank you very much for your time. And I'm happy to take your questions. Terrific, well, that was a fantastic overview and you definitely hit uh, some of the highlights uh, you know, that we're gonna continue to talk about throughout the, uh, the rest of the session. Uh, I'll just, for the, for the audience, the integrated air and space piece really goes toward uh, the PLA's move toward jointness, right? So they are not a joint force, but they are absolutely trying to become one. Um, and so it's, uh, it's very important to understand how the PLA Air Force thinks about it and what they think their future role is gonna be in that. So thanks for highlighting that. I'm sure we'll get some questions there. Uh, and then just talking about what a strategic Air Force versus the world-class versus a global and, and how, uh, you know, I, we certainly don't know what they mean necessarily. We have some good guesses, uh, but, uh, you know, they may, in, in fact, not know what they mean. Uh, and Xi Jinping may, may have other thoughts. So uh, I really appreciate you, uh, you highlighting that for us. And again, uh, for those of you on uh, YouTube and Facebook, keep putting your questions in there. We've already got some in the chat here. So, uh, all right. So with that, we'll turn it over to Derek. Uh, and uh, just just for everyone's knowledge, we'll take all the questions at the end uh, and kind of have more of a, a roundtable uh, discussion there. So, uh, all right, with that, I see Derek is up. Uh, we will go ahead and turn it over to you, my friend, uh, and the floor is yours. Okay, uh, well, good afternoon. Um, so I prepared to talk about the topic that I think ACC would be most interested in, and that is China and Agile Combat Employment, or ACE. Um, but I'm happy to field questions about anything. Um, so, you know, other things that I've written about are listed in my bio. If you have any other questions, 
um, please feel free to, to ask. Um, so last year, I wrote two articles, uh, one about how the PLA assessed ACE and one about how the PLA seems to be preparing to emulate ACE. Um, there's usually no shortage of articles in Chinese media about US military matters. Um, but what I tried to do was find an assessment of ACE by the PLA itself, not, not just something that's written by Chinese people. Um, fortunately, I did find uh, one assessment that was written by three scholars working at something called the War Research Institute of the PLA's Academy of Military Science. And it was, a, it was published in the PLA's official newspaper. So the War Research Institute um, this isn't just a research institute. It actually develops operational concepts for the PLA and it designs operations for the PLA. So, you know, even if what was written in the assessment isn't gospel, um, it still carries some weight because the same guys who would be probably devising the strategy to counteract ACE were writing this article, or at least some of them. Uh, so they found um, three exploitable weaknesses in ACE. Um, and I personally only found two of those to be valid. Uh, so they argued that, um, you know, I thought their, their least valid argument was that they could just shorten the kill chain um, by, they said, for deploying maritime and aerial reconnaissance and strike platforms. Um, I, you know, theoretically that's possible. I just, I think it's a lot easier said than done. Um, if you deploy reconnaissance aircraft, um, sure they can find the enemy, but the enemy can also find them. So I, I think that you know they would be exposing those platforms uh, to as much risk. Um, so I, I, again, it, it's something that's theoretically possible. I just don't think that that is a valid strategy for. Um, it's not it, it, that that alone, at least, would not counteract ACE. Uh, however, their other two points I thought were actually valid. So they they also pointed out that, you know, in short, logistics is ACE's toughest challenge. So ACE is, you know, in ACE, um, combat units, combat aircraft would be sustained with um, something called regional base cluster pre-positioning kits or RBCP kits. Um, those are those are designed to sustain uh, operations at airstrips for a limited period of time. They can't do it forever. And key nodes will always exist in a logistics network. And that's something that these authors pointed out. Um, they specifically mentioned uh, permanent bases, but it goes beyond just permanent bases. Any, any place where you have a port or a depot, that's a, a key node in a logistics network. Um, and so, you know, targeting those key nodes would be one way of defeating ACE without actually um, targeting runways and aircraft. Um, again, that's not, it's not a perfect strategy uh, for counteracting ACE, but it, it, it is, I think, a, a valid strategy for attempting to do so. And one of our key problems is, um, unlike in Europe, um, in the Asia Pacific, for us to sustain operations across the ocean, um, we, we just have fewer options for positioning key logistical nodes. So, um, you know, it would be a lot easier for China to, you know, you could say defeat air power by land or, or through land um, if they, they target our logistics. Finally, their other point was that um, because ACE depends on diplomacy to work. It depends on the cooperation of our allies. Um, it's also possible, if they applied, to defeat ACE diplomatically. If our allies refuse to let us implement ACE in the first place, it's a non-starter. Um, my suggestion was that, you know, uh, we increase the number of allies who would allow us to implement ACE, of course, but also that we, um, build concealed and redundant depots on land in those countries uh, so that we have, so it would be possible for us to transport materiel over land, uh, increasing the, the number of options that we have for transportation of, of combat support material. So at roughly the same time as that article is being published, um, 
the the PLATH actually seems to have begun looking into their own version of ACE. And one, one thing to remember or to keep in mind is that even though the, the PLA was you know, negatively assessing our, our capability to implement ACE, they never actually criticized ACE on theoretical grounds. Um, and they seem to think that it's, it's still a sound strategy. And this exercise that they conducted uh, at about the same time that my article was published kind of seems to indicate that they, they accept the logic behind ACE. So they, the exercise is very unusual uh, because uh, they stated that it had three purposes. Um, one was to, to figure out how they could sustain combat operations from airfields lacking the material and the support personnel that they usually have at their bases. And they were trying to assess the minimal combat support needs of aircraft operating from those airfields and also to figure out um, how to organize and exercise command and control over the combat support elements servicing aircraft at those airfields. So they're, in short, they're trying to figure out not just the, the minimal uh, needs um, as far as you know, fuel and ordnance, but also trying to figure out what is the smallest combat support element that they could have operating or servicing aircraft at those airfields and how would they um, deploy those, those personnel. That caused me, they never came out and said, this is our own version of base, but that caused me to think that they were really trying to implement or trying to figure out, um, you know, form a basis uh, for their own version of ACE. I think it makes sense for them to emulate ACE um, for the very same reasons that, that we want to. Um, air bases are, are vulnerable. Um, and, you know, the Chinese Air Force is going to be just as reliant on air bases as, as anyone else. So it's prudent for them to prepare for the worst. Um, but it isn't, I don't think they're just looking at this as, as an emergency measure. Um, the PLA in general seems convinced that you know, converging capabilities across a distributed network of small formations is the future of warfare. That, that, that is joint all domain operations in a nutshell. Um, and that's, that's why they've actually adopted all domain operations as part of their doctrine. Um, ACE can be said to be J to one practice. Um, so it, it makes doctrinal sense for the PLAF to work towards the same ends as us. Um, it's just, if you think this is the future of warfare, this is what you need to do, um, then it makes sense for them to, to try to do it on their own, to, to try to do it themselves as well. So I think that because we started earlier, we're ahead of, of them in developing ACE, um, but they do have their own advantages. Their primary advantage is logistical. Um, they not only can they they mobilize civilian transportation assets, they can mobilize people. They can mobilize civilians also. Um, they can do it with impunity. Um, but they'll also be operating from their own territory, operating from land. Um, so they have uh, they have more options. Unlike us, they would have more options for transportation, for transshipment and storage of material. Um, across a pretty well-developed uh, transportation network um, and logistical network in, you know, along the east coast of, of China. So, you know, that, that I think is their, their key advantage. Um, that alone won't make them agile, uh, but it would make their lo logistics harder to defeat if we were to adopt the strategy that they are hinting at uh, to defeat our own ace. So, you know, none of that, you know, this is, it isn't clear. We've only seen one instance of this, this exercise. Um, I'm sure that it will take them some time to, to work out what they've, what are the, the basic needs um, and the basic, uh, you know, the, the basic, t no, not TTPs, uh, the basic, you know, tactics, techniques, and procedures to, to actually implement this thing. Um, so, I, you know, if they were to do the same thing as us, it doesn't make our operational concept obsolete. It just makes it more imperative that we succeed in implementing it. And it, it also means that our success in implementing ACE, achieving that capability, won't necessarily um, ensure victory. Um, we just, we're gonna have to, we're still gonna have to be, we're gonna have to be ahead of them. Uh, or we're gonna have to do things better and faster and, and uh, uh, that's really all I have to say about that. So um, 
I welcome any questions about this or, or any other topic. Thank you. All right, thanks. Well, I appreciate that. Uh, and I think you did a really good job kind of uh, contextualizing it and, and bringing it home to the Air Force, right, to ACC. Uh, and this is important to understand how is, uh, how is the PLA looking at what we're doing? Uh, how are they adopting it, right? And I like, I like to tell people, you know, they haven't fought a war for a long time, but they are absolutely voracious consumers of all of the uh, pubs uh, and the lessons learned and the, uh, you know, the best practices and things that we put out. Uh, and so it's really important to know, A, what they're getting from us uh, and B, how they're going to adopt both for themselves and to counter us. I think you did a really good job of framing that. Uh, and so I appreciate that. Uh, and then uh, next, we're going to turn to Eli Turk. Uh, he is going to bring us home for the, the formal presentations. And then we will get to some discussion and some Q&A. Uh, so please keep populating the chats. But uh, until then, Eli, we're going to turn it over, uh, over to you. Thanks. Um, so a lot of my more recent research has uh, been more focused on what uh, the, the PLAF has like right now in terms of, of logistical capabilities and infrastructure. So uh, instead of you know what they uh, aspire to, it's going to be more of what what uh, they have currently, right at this moment. All right, sorry, one second. Let me show my screen. Some slides for y'all. Great. Um, so this presentation, uh, I'm going to provide an overview of of uh, PLAF fixed wing aviation readiness, uh, the current organizational systems uh, responsible for maintaining these readiness rates and physical infrastructure behind uh, readiness or sort of supporting the PLAF in general. Uh, oops, sorry about that. So currently uh, the PLAF uh, maintains or purportedly maintains a highly ready force that frequently flies conducting both short and long range training sorties uh, in and out of garrison. Uh, just for some quick context, this training can you know, consist of up to two sorties within a 12 hour period with a, a varying number of aircraft um, from you know as small as two, a group of a flight of two aircraft to up to up to twenty aircraft for what they call blue on red training. Um, under this relatively demanding training uh, regime, the PLAF claims it's able to maintain readiness rates in the range of eighty percent uh, for combat aircraft, and up to around ninety percent uh, for transport and special mission aircraft. So your airborne early warning control and electronic warfare and other stuff. Um, the PLAF defines uh, aircraft readiness rates. Uh, as the number of aircraft within a unit that can perform uh, a mission within a certain time period. Uh, so that uh, as a percentage of the total aircraft of that unit. So this is sort of similar to uh, our concept of uh, mission capable rates. Uh, so self-reported statistics uh, by the PLAF uh, beginning in the late 90s and sort of early 2000s range on the lower end of 70%, which is possibly due to uh, a more fuel restricted force operating primarily uh, legacy aircraft not having the material necessary to sort of maintain high readiness, let alone training. Um, we've observed some articles from this time from the, the PLA Air Force's uh, official newspaper uh, describing ways that uh, aviation units have limited fuel consumption during training so they can you know, maintain their, their stockpiles. Um, but as the force you know, began to transition into a relatively modern capable force, uh, aviation units began adopting fourth generation aircraft uh, en masse and their overall readiness remained, sort of started to creep up, but remained in the high 70 to low 80 percent, percents. Um, whereas new aircraft readiness, so this is going to be for your, your newer fourth gen aircraft started to creep up in, into the 80 to 90 percents percentile. Um, today, uh, claims uh, for readiness of uh, 4.5 gen aircraft um, claim to be around 90%, but a lot of these claims are centered around uh, training events, which will obviously give units time to conduct maintenance and, and increase readiness for this for a specific exercise. Uh, it's important to note that these rates are probably uh, inflated for propaganda purposes, and it's difficult to compare uh, these claims to uh, US Air Force uh, readiness data due to both the on average younger age of the PLAF fleet uh, and sort of the base statistical reporting units for the US Air Force and the PLAF don't, don't really overlap very well. So it's harder to compare an organization that has fewer number of aircraft uh, to maintain versus a, a larger uh, unit. Uh, moving on to organizational support structure, at the lowest level, uh, logistics and maintenance uh, uh, 
support uh, is concentrated uh, in an aviation brigade's airfield station and its a uh, maintenance squadron. Airfield stations are responsible for maintaining runways, physical airfield garrison infrastructure, the storage supply uh, and maintenance of munitions and fuel, uh, as well as transporting the fuel and munitions to aircraft. And, uh, additionally, uh, airfield stations maintain a, a ground support element uh, that work with an aviation brigade's maintenance squadron to act as a uh, ground crew. The sort of primary interface for airfield stations at this level is going to be what they call the four station company. Uh, and they're responsible for providing auxiliary power, uh, oxygen, environmental control, hydraulics and lubricant and chemical support to aircraft. Uh, additionally, airfield stations are also responsible for providing uh, support for the storage and maintenance and, and machining of certain aircraft parts and components. Uh, moving to the airfield brigade, uh, sorry, aviation brigade maintenance units, uh, maintenance groups. These units uh, maintain repair shops that are responsible for conducting more uh, intensive maintenance and inspection than what ground crew are able conduct, to conduct on the flight line. Uh, repairs that can't be conducted by these units, uh, such as uh, engine turbine repair and more complicated tasks of that nature are typically uh, chopped up to uh, PLAF factories, which are subordinate to the PLAF equipment department. And they're uh, sort of geographically dispersed all across the, the PRC. Uh, some of these factories are de uh, dedicated to specific types of aircraft. Uh, for example, there's a, a Y8 factory in Western China, whereas others are dedicated to specific uh, systems or uh, subsystems, sorry, uh, such as engines. Uh, there's two factories I can name off the top of my head. They're fun PLA numbered factories, uh, 5719 and 5713 are two uh, engine factories. Moving then up to the base level, uh, a base is a larger command uh, responsible for multiple uh, air defense, radar, and aviation units within a, a geographic region. Base support departments uh, appear to, at a minimum, supply uh, general Air Force-specific consumables and medical support, uh, as well as base support departments uh, maintain emergency support elements, which primarily that uh, I've been seeing uh, are uh, emergency fuel uh, support elements, which uh, routinely conduct training to set up fuel bladders, uh, both at airfields and, and other locations. Interestingly, uh, theory command air forces, so this is the their lar even larger uh, organizational structure. Uh, it's their, these, their support departments also maintain uh, emergency support de detachments, but these are more um, engineering support for more complex and involved uh, runway repair, as well as what they call aviation material support, which is your aircraft parts and components. Um, Theater Command Air Force support departments are also responsible for maintaining a network of uh, depots and transportation units, which train to move massive amounts of um, material, uh, munitions and fuel within and in between theater commands. These detachments are uh, generally train uh, uh, to move large amounts of the, this material by truck column uh, and, and rail, and then to establish uh, field depots. In order to augment these structures, uh, the PLAF has been continually integrating civilian support. As, as Derek mentioned, they have uh, a lot of civilian support they can mobilize. Um, so whether this takes the form of you know, mobilizing civilian uh, shipping providers to conduct direct delivery to units or provide air cargo support. Uh, it also includes uh, getting civilian personnel from either you know, the PLA Air Force's own factories, excuse me, or uh, uh, SOE factories to come uh, to conduct engine uh, repair or, or replacement uh, on-site at airfields, uh, uh, as well as you know, just fuel companies helping ship fuel around. Uh, in addition to its civilian support, uh, the PLA uh, can mobilize uh, militia to, to provide support to uh, PLAF aviation units. This typically takes the form uh, of militia units augmenting uh, like your rapid response fuel teams and helping with uh, returning fuel supply to airfields, as well as uh, assisting in, in engineering capabilities at airfield stations, you know, helping repair runways, uh, buildings and structures. Uh, moving now to physical infrastructure, uh, the PLAF has been conducting a, a long-term campaign uh, to modernize and expand support infrastructure at its airfields. Uh, airfields home to modern combat aircraft typically have both uh, 
on and off-site fuel and, and munitions storage and handling facilities with the off-site facilities typically being a lot larger than our on-site counterpart parts, excuse me. Newer construction of munitions facilities uh, is beginning to focus on, on a greater number of a new type of semi-buried and hardened storage facility, uh, as well as primarily buried uh, or partially buried fuel tanks. Out of the 91 airfields uh, I've been able to, to identify with some assistance, um, 80 have been identified as uh, having a, additional apron space to support both out of garrison training and potentially uh, out of garrison operations for aircraft. Uh, currently, only about half of the airfields uh, for combat aircraft that I've been able to identify actually have buried fuel storage. And in most cases, this only accounts for a, a, a portion of that airfield's total fuel storage. Uh, in total, uh, facilities typically uh, have between one and three uh, large storage tanks with a, with a volume of around uh, 20,000 cubic meters. Uh, two to four with, with about half that volume, and then are between two and five uh, smaller tanks with a total volume of 500 cubic meters. Um, additionally, the, the total number of buildings in, in the munitions storage and handling facilities uh, range between 10 and 13. Um, so as Derek mentioned, um, the PLAF is sort of starting to realize that their current support structure is not the, the best suited for um, a modern conflict and they are attempting to adapt to, to improve that. Um, so given a, a hypothetical Taiwan scenario, there's going to be, this will sort of further, given aircraft ranges, this is gonna further limit the number of uh, military and civilian airfields that could be used to host air operations. Um, there are about 29, uh, total, sorry, military uh, airfields within this range and roughly 50 civilian airfields. Um, of these airfields, uh, only 11 maintain buried fuel storage, only nine have direct railhead access. Um, and so given sort of the, the large and relatively slow nature of, of movement for these sort of larger um, support elements, it's, uh, they're going to be further restricted in their ability to sort of rapidly either repair and, and you know resume operations at these airfields or move around support personnel as necessary to assist in, in operations at other airfields as their home uh, airfields get attrited. And that's uh, all I have and I look forward to answering your questions. All right, terrific. Uh, and so um, I think that that last point certainly uh, brings home an important uh, an important factor that we don't necessarily always think about here. Um, oh, there's a good shot for you. Uh, <laughs> um, is the uh, the integration and the use potential use of um, civilian facilities, right? So uh, certainly airports, but also fuel storage um, and uh, equipment. Uh, now that they have, uh, you know, a, the Joint Logistics Support Force and put increasing uh, emphasis on military civil fusion, uh, it really is kind of a much bigger problem, uh, problems that they were, they were facing at and looking at. Uh, and uh, it's absolutely critical to understand the logistics side of things, right? And so um, as, they, as they go forward, as we go forward, trying to figure out, hey, how is China going to do this? How long can they sustain those operations? Uh, and what, uh, what is the manner they're going to be able to do that? And where is that coming from? I think are going to be some key questions that, uh, that we'll deal with. So, well, thank you to uh, all the participants so far. And the Q&A and the chat are now uh, open. Uh, they've been open the whole time. But uh, for uh, questions and comments, uh, and we'll just start going through those as best we can. So please feel free to populate those. Uh, the first one. Uh, asked about um, uh, how the PLA uh, and specifically the PLAF uh, are using uh, AI, artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, to supplement or augment their forces. So uh, these two terms, we won't get into the semantics of it, but basically how are they using uh, high power computing and potentially semi-autonomous or autonomous weapons uh, and systems to go ahead and, and prosecute that. So uh, certainly if uh, anybody wants to jump in on that, they can. Uh, I will say it is my own personal belief, and there is discussion about this, uh, that in the big picture, 
uh, I think the PLA is going to be far more likely to uh, integrate uh, fully autonomous systems uh, sooner than the United States. One, because we're just going to have a, we have a different outlook on things. Uh, and I think that the, the PLA is going to be more likely to want to get the uh, soft, squishy actuators, the humans, uh, uh, out of that loop because they see the humans as kind of the weak link. They're the ones that are potentially politically unreliable or not educated enough. Uh, and if you can write the right algorithm and get enough data, uh, I think the uh, the Communist Party and its military are more than happy to turn that over uh, to autonomous systems. Uh, and certainly we've seen uh, the massive swarms that they've created. We've seen them in, in training and exercises and testing. Uh, and this is absolutely something that they are all in uh, and rapidly expanding. So uh, Christina, I know you've looked at this uh, quite a bit, so I'll turn it over to you for some comments there. And Eli and Derek, if you want to jump in after that, feel free. Or Rod, our, our research director, Rod Lee's on the call as well. So uh, anybody else that wants to take, but over to over to you, Christina. Sure, uh, Brendan. I was just going to give some kind of initial comments, and then um, I'm sure Eli, Derek, and Rod have, may have more um, specific or or um, other augmentation. So um, one thing I wanted to point out is that for AI and machine learning, you know, this is part of broader efforts to improve civil military fusion across um, the PLA, of course. Uh, and military civil fusion was elevated to national strategy within China, I believe in 2015. Um, so this is kind of um, one component and one focus area of that effort. I think some components and examples we've seen are um, bringing in civilian companies um, um, to PLA equipment modernization um, that leverage um, artificial intelligence and other um, advanced technologies, right? So uh, bringing that innovation um, to the military. Um, we've seen a discussion about big data analysis as useful for monitoring and early warning, um, as well as, as as a tool for more realistic exercises within the PLA, including you know simulations, um, probably as well as other types of exercises. Um, and I think um, a particular um, area of equipment um, and, and forces we should be looking at, of course, are unmanned um, aerial vehicles. Um, however, there's a lot of trade space to discuss there. You know, Ch China's a, a civilian, um, a commercial leader in, in production of drones, and we're, we're starting to see, you know, more and more examples and discussion of uh, drones being used within the PLA. So I think there's certainly more research we could that could be done um, as this is really exploding um, right now as, a, as an emerging topic. Um, and I'll also link to a couple of reports um, uh, in the chat um, in terms of um, the PLA's focus on informatization and now the push toward intelligentization um, uh, and, and those starting to be associated with some of the, the milestones that Xi Jinping has set for the PLA out through 2049. Um, and um, uh, DOD's annual report to Congress has some discussion of um, artificial intelligence and machine learning as well. So I think those are some helpful resources. Um, you know, how is it um, operationalized as part of their, you know, concepts? Um, and then, you know, what, what all is DOD tracking from year to year? Um, but um, turn it over to others now. Yeah, absolutely. And I, uh, I'll just emphasize that uh, it's not just the Air Force that owns the UAVs, much like the United States. So everybody in the PLA, they all love UAVs. Uh, every service, including even the rocket force, which is, you know, mostly long range, using it for targeting for BDA. Uh, and so they are certainly all in on that. So Eli, thoughts? Yeah, one of, one of the things I've been tracking for a while, which I find more interesting than actually uh, prob probably operationally useful is at, at like a smaller scale, the, the PLA in general, um, you know, all of, uh, the Air Force, the Navy and, and the ground forces have all sort of enjoyed publicizing like using UAVs for both, you know, delivery of food um, which is, you know, of limited utility for larger scale logistics, but also what they call delivery of like in, uh, crucial medical supplies or, or spare parts to um, ra remote radar stations. So the PLAF maintains this massive network of, of radar stations that are, some of them are in a little more uh, developed areas, but some of them are at, in the absolute middle of nowhere on a mountaintop uh, and are pretty hard to reach. Um, and, and, but this, sort of is also couched in this more academic discussion uh, as Christina pointed out of, of sort of the informatization and automation of logistics. Um, and obviously, you know, PLA is, is a relatively modern and capable force and the, you know, the civilian 
logistics companies all already have completely automated warehouse or not completely, but have significantly automated warehouses to improve, uh, you know, you know, shipping times. Um, and the PLA has already uh, begun to do this as well. Um, but there's been a, a long term sort of need and desire in PLA writing for the for like more accurate demand data, and I think that these technologies are going to play a, a crucial role in sort of a, a better harnessing that data for more uh, accurate logistics, as they like to call it. I was just going to, as the resident contrarian, uh, I was just going to pipe in and say that <laughs> I think Dr. Mulvaney is correct, uh, that the PLA would probably uh, field autonomous uh, platforms before we would. Um, but I, I think it's a question of scale um, because I think the PLA in general, um, so in, in China, there is a general, um, I think fascination or love of technology. Um, people, Chinese people in general are less um, cautious, I guess, about the dangers of technology than, than we are. I think in general, that is probably true. In particular, it probably isn't true. But um, I think the PLA sees it as something that they can't avoid doing uh, rather than something that they, they just want to do. Um, AI will be necessary. If they're going to create their own version of JADC2, they're going to have to get better at AI. Um, and autonomous systems can be relied on uh, to do particular missions, particular tasks. But just as you see people who are really enthusiastic about the future of, you know, so intelligentization is, is really just the application of artificial intelligence to warfare. So th there are a lot of people who are enthusiastic about these, these new technologies and these new techniques, uh, but there are just as many people on the PLA who say, well, hold on, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a perfect balance that we're gonna have to achieve. And I think, for them, they would say the, the correct answer would be uh, man-machine teaming. Um, that's, that comes up very often in PLA writings. Um, I don't think the majority of the PLA is ready to just let, let the machines, let the robots do everything. Um, not because they're worried about Skynet, but because um, they have to maintain some sort of control over what's happening. I think they understand the dangers of, of autonomous systems, just as they're fascinated with the technology. Yeah, Christina, go ahead. I was just going to add, I think um, both folks have raised important points. And one thing also is that um, the PLA is still um, transforming um, its force structure. And I think, you know, there's certainly elements within the, the PLAF and PLA that um, are seeing this as, uh, you know, the areas to push. But I think um, there's like a broader question too about, uh, um, you know, it's likely the, the PLA will continue to downsize on sort of this outdated force structure, get rid of senior officers that, um, um, you know, in the, their bloated officer corps. Like, I, I think all the, the technology and other arguments folks have made are valid, but I kind of wonder if there's some sticks in the mud, you know, that, that grew up in a, a kind of analog PLA um, and sort of how the, will that um, change, you know, over the next decade or so as the PLA continues to get, um, maybe not lean, but leaner. Um, and, and focuses even more on technology. So I just wanted to offer that up in case folks have thoughts. Yeah, that's a great point. And that's one of the things that we like to do at Cassie is just make sure that we're presenting the, the clearer picture, right? They're not 10 feet tall. And uh, that's why we employ Derek as our resident contrarian to make sure we're all on focus and, uh, and keeping things in the real world because, uh, you know, AI machine learning is tough. Uh, you know, we got some great minds working on it. But I want to just highlight and emphasize one thing that both Derek and Eli kind of alluded to. Uh, and again, it goes back to the military civil fusion. I think probably everyone on the call knows, but certainly when you talk to our friends and partners and allies out there, when you talk to industry, uh, we really need to make sure that they understand the nature of military civil fusion and the fact that you know there isn't anything that is purely commercial and there isn't anything that's purely scientific when you're dealing with China because that's not how they conceptualize it. Uh, and that anything that goes there that approves, you know, even just logistics warehouses, right, in uh, you know, uh, some sort of fulfillment center in Hong Kong or in Shenzhen, uh, you know, or transportation hubs and things like that. All of that gets fed back into the machine and all of that goes uh, and eventually supports the PLA and their, and their drive 
toward uh, toward you know modernizing becoming uh, a fully you know integrated and in, in, you know moving toward automated systems uh, for logistics. So that's really important to keep in mind. Uh, I want to jump over to our uh, friends over on YouTube. Uh, so from Five AFB, it says the speakers talked about the lack of a true joint force capabilities at this point. Um, can we talk about any of the doctrinal or actual relationship between the PLA Air Force and the Naval Aviation Forces? Um, and so I know we've done a little bit of work on the past. Uh, Christina, I know that uh, you've taken a, a little bit of a look at that at, at points. Uh, you can certainly comment on that. I'll, I'll kind of back you up after that. Yeah, sounds great. So um, uh, one thing, if we look back historically, is that um, you know the PLA Naval Aviation's role, um, they were set up in uh, 1952, the Land Aviation Branch. Um, their missions didn't overlap with the PLAF at all. They were focused on supporting the sister branches in the, the PLA Navy, uh, mostly conducting anti-surface and anti-submarine operations. Um, so I think um, overall the trend is um, uh, growing um, collaboration, some joint exercises between the PLAF um, aviation forces and the plan writ large. Um, I'd have to look specifically about, you know, what extent do we see them training together in a really meaningful way, with aviation forces and aviation forces. Um, so, so some examples we see in the key training brands, which um, there's five sort of milestones, um, and Cassie has a report on this, uh, milestone exercises. Um, one's called Red Sword, there's Golden Helmet, Golden Shield, um, um, uh, and a couple others um, that focus on sometimes confrontation training between um, um, uh, combat um, aircraft, um, some focus on um, air to surface strikes, uh, and some focus on ground based air defense. Um, so we've seen, um, you know, sometimes PLA Navy aviation pilots will join. Um, uh, in a couple instances, we've also seen some limited training um, overseas or, or with um, uh, foreign counterparts like plant aviation joining a PLAF exercise with Pakistan. Um, but those are not um, necessarily significant encounters with a large number of forces on each side, right? You know, might be one or two pilots only. Um, but um, Brendan, feel free to, to augment. Yeah, no, that's, uh, that's basically what we've seen as well. We, uh, we looked into this and found uh, they do talk about it at, at points, but just there isn't a whole, whole lot reported. Um, one of the reasons, just for those of you uh, uh, who aren't familiar with the new theater command structure, one of the reasons for the theater command structure was to try to get at uh, a way to integrate uh, these aviation forces from the different services, which was just really uh, systematically and organizationally challenging beforehand. Um, and so uh, that's one of the reasons that they did that. Still not a lot of indication that they're doing it. Uh, I know uh, Christina mentioned Ken Allen. Ken loves to tell the story about these naval pilots that went to go participate in one of these exercises, and they trained for six months, and they ended up, uh, you know, focusing solely on how are you going to beat the Air Force guys. And at the end of the day, they won by hiding in clouds, and that was their their, their key takeaway. So uh, it's a great question. We are monitoring because we at Cassie we do everything that flies, right? So it's not just the Air Force; it's naval aviation, Army aviation, rockets, missiles, space, cyber, and, and the civilian infrastructure that supports it all. So. Uh, Christine, have you got a follow up to that? Yeah, I just wanted to um, raise something, and I think Rod might also have some thoughts on this too. Um, uh, he's recently looked at the airborne forces. Um, I has have as well. Um, so for China, um, airborne the airborne corps is part of the PLA Air Force. Um, so there are some examples there where um, uh, Air Force uh, airborne units, um, I believe, were training with parts of the PLA Navy, but. Um, you know, again, it's a pretty recent example. So um, Rod may want to add um, additional discussion on that. Yeah, no, that's a great point. And just again, just organized differently. So we have to make sure we know who we're looking at. And, you know, for the US, the airborne forces would be in the army, but, uh, you know, for them, it's the, in, in airborne, in Air Force force. Derek, was there a, there a comment uh, where you just? Yeah, um, I was going to say that it's, so the joint training between the the uh, Air Force and the Navy is, it's very infrequent <laughs> to the point of where it just doesn't happen very often. I, I, I can't say that it's it's nil, uh, but it's for for two forces that operate some of the same aircraft, uh, it's, it's rather odd. It's remarkable that they don't do more training, uh, more joint training, but uh, the, the PLAF and the PLA Army um, have gotten much further along. And so, um, just Christine mentioned the Airborne Corps. 
they did their very first um, joint exercise between the, the PLA Airborne Corps and the PLA Army um, la at the end of last year. Again, two forces that operate in the same domain. Um, they've done force on force exercises where the Army operated as the op for the opposing force, but um, they, didn't, they didn't actually train to fight together. They were training to fight against each other. Um, so this was the very first time where they actually trained to fight together. Um, and that was just the end of last year. Um, they're much further along though when it comes to air defense. Um, and um, I don't know, maybe it's just, it's uh, a matter of just setting different priorities, but um, for air defense, the, the PLA Army has worked for probably two, three years now um, at really integrating itself into a joint uh, integrated air defense system um, and, you know, letting it support, basically supporting it itself to the Air Force, letting the Air Force take the lead in, in conducting air, air defense. Um, and I think they've been much more successful at, at, at that than anything else. Another area that I've looked at is close air support. Um, and that's, that's been a, a key weakness um, that they've had, uh, but they've worked for well over a decade now to, to get this going. And it seems that just now they're, they're finally, um, finally laying a, a, a solid basis for, for practicing that. Um, they, they've got the, it seems like they have now the, the TTPs and the, the systems for doing that. Now it's just a matter of actually practicing it. If you look at some of the close air support exercises that the, the PLAF does now, they're still incredibly basic. They don't involve um, live munitions. Uh, they don't involve guys on the ground most of the time. It's just, you know, fly to this place and hit this target. Um, but, you know, give them maybe another five years and we could be looking at something very different. So they're they are working towards it. It's just that they're starting from the baseline of zero. Um, so, you know, they're not, they're not joint like we are now, um, but they are working at it. And I think over time, we're going to see them becoming a, a true joint force. Yeah, that's great. Uh, Eli, was there a comment there? Or were you just... I was just going to, going to echo what Derek, Derek said with the, the Naval Aviation and, and the PLAF joint training on, on like the support front, because you would think, you know, two organizations that operate basically the same, most of the same aircraft that they would try to, you know, supplement and, and help each other out that way. But uh, in, in my research, I've only seen like uh, maybe a handful of examples of them doing that uh, on the logistics and the equipment support front. Yeah, it used to be so bad they couldn't even refuel at other bases because they had different nozzles, even if they had the same kind of aircraft. Just kind of things that are crazy to us in the United States, but uh, you know they're still they're still just working through. So we had a couple questions about uh, ACE. Actually, uh, the first is kind of an organizational cultural question: uh, Is do we think that their centralized control of forces will limit their their ability to employ ACE? Uh, Derek, you're the one who brought up ACE. We'll uh, toss that to you first, and then. Christina or Eli, you want to jump in on that? Yeah, I saw the question and I came up with yes and no, <laughs> thinking about it. <laughs> um, I honestly, I don't know. Um, I, I don't think they see it as a weakness. Um, and I think the reason is not simply because that's the way they do things. It's because um, one of the keys to implementing a successfully is coordination. Um, you still need unified uh, command in order to, to execute ACE. It's not, it's not just random movement. And so um, I think looking at that, for them, they'll say that centralized control is actually an advantage there. Um, I don't honestly know if that is true or not, but I, I don't think that it would be just for executing ACE, I don't think it would be quite the disadvantage that we'd hope it would be. Um, because it, yeah, I just, I think that centralized control is necessary regardless. Uh, it's just, again, it's probably a matter of degree more it is, a, a, you know, a binary uh, thing of having it or not. If it's, if they're trying to make every decision um, at the highest levels of command, 
uh, such lines of command, then then they'll have a problem because um, you just have the the burden of, of too much information, too many decisions to make. And the, you know, if if you need uh, General Admiral so and so to say move these aircraft to this airfield, at that point, yes, the the system will break down. But I don't think that the PLA is is that high bound that they will have to do that. I think they they talk about it in different contexts, uh, but they do talk about um, uh, moving pushing authority down to the lowest levels possible because they understand that this is a weakness of their system. Um, so I think they recognize the advantages and disadvantages of centralized control. Uh, whether they can find that perfect balance or not is another question. I, you know, I think that as long as they understand what their problems are and they have the, the desire to, to remedy those problems, they could probably do it. It's just going to take time. Yep. Yeah. Anyone else want to jump in on that one? The, uh, the, the follow on question or the related question with ACE comes from our YouTube folks. Uh, and they want to know basically, hey, how does the Belt and Road, right? Talking about the, the whole of the system, how does the Belt and Road uh, either improve China's ability to do ACE, should they want to do it in the future? Uh, or uh, perhaps more crit critically to us, how does it prevent us from perhaps pursuing some of those things? Does it foreclose uh, options uh, through diplomatic or economic? Trade leverage, all those kinds of things. What are the uh, what are the impacts of Belt and Road on either their ability to conduct ACE or ours? Thoughts? Well, so I think that war is a political issue. Um, so if just because China has built a, an airfield or a port or something in another country it doesn't give them a hundred percent perfect leverage or, you know, <laughs> they don't necessarily have command over that, that state. That state does not necessarily become a client. Um, so whether they can use that for military operations or not is, is kind of another matter altogether. Um, it could be advantageous to them. Um, and the deeper that they can, you know, corrupt <laughs> another regime, uh, the deeper that they can, the, the tighter they can tie that regime to them, uh, the more likely it is possible, the more likely that it is for them to, to have access to that. I just, I don't, yeah, it's one of those things that I think, yes, there are, theoretically it's possible, um, but I, we are, uh, we're not gonna be able to implement ACE outside of our ally network of allies. I don't see that happening, you know, we're not gonna be able to go to Vietnam and land aircraft there and, and you know, implement ACE in Vietnam. I just don't foresee that happening. Um, or, you know, Laos or Thailand or any, any, any country that is close enough to China to, to be strategically significant. Um, uh, so, you know, the, the degree of, of leverage that China has over our allies. So Japan, South Korea, the Philippines. Philippines is probably uh, a slightly different case, but um, I don't see that as being so great, especially with the Belt and Road, um, that they have an advantage over us there. Um, I think the, the political angle for them is, is different. Um, it, it isn't Belt and Road that, that would give them some hope of diplomatically defeating ACE. It's more, um, I guess, the question of the circumstances at the time. So whether you know people in South Korea or Japan or the Philippines, for that matter, want to be involved in a war with China, because there there will be consequences for the population there. Um, so I, I I guess in a way I'm saying that Belt and Road is probably irrelevant in that case. Christina, thoughts? Sure. I just kind of wanted to maybe talk a little bit about some of the um, assumptions or broader framing of the, the question. I think um, uh, definitely agree with um, overall what Derek was saying. I mean, one one thing is, you know, whether BRI presence leads to stronger PLA presence, right, in overseas countries. Right now, there's only one overseas um, uh, uh, base uh, in Djibouti. Um, we do have a couple pieces of evidence that suggest um, 
the BRI, or rather the PLA will be carrying out some of its engagements with BRI countries, right? Um, so in early 2019, uh, uh, Xi Jinping talked about setting up a security system for the Bell and Road Initiative. Um, and then in the summer of 2019, um, the Defense Minister Wei Fenghe um, was at a forum in the Caribbean, I believe, and said that, you know, we, the PLA, are going to conduct exchanges with countries under the Bell and Road Initiative. Um, so I think, you know, some BRI countries will become, you know, areas of focus for PLA engagements. Um, but overall, you know, like the security links of, of BRI are, are, can be quite rudimentary. And I think that they, um, you can make the case that that's true in a lot of countries. Um, in terms of, um, you know, the, the class, I was a little confused about the question. Was it talking about primarily um, China's ability to carry out a potential ACE concept as well, or just their ability to stymie us? No, yeah, it, the, the question yeah. was really both. It was, you know, okay. if, if China wanted to do their own ACE, does this give yeah. them potential to, to do it in, say, yeah. Cambodia or, or other places? Yeah. So then, yeah, the second element would be the PLAF's presence overseas is still really uh, rudimentary itself, right? First overseas base has naval forces um, in Djibouti. Um, we did a report for, uh, I did a report for um, Cassie a couple of years ago, and we looked at where have um, fixed wing air PLAF aircraft gone overseas? Um, and we looked from like 2002 to 2016. Um, and we only found, you know, discussion of about 40 discrete operations, right? Obviously that's grown in recent years. China has been using the, the PLA Air Force to do COVID related diplomacy, sending PPE and, um, you know, uh, uh, vaccines and stuff like that. Um, but, you know, this is still landing at a, a country's major international airport, uh, dropping off the supplies and, and then heading back home. Um, so I think, you know, it's, the overseas capability of the PLA Air Force in particular is just, you know, not very robust to the extent where they could be themselves um, thinking about this type of concept yet. Yeah, that's a great point that uh, most, uh, uh, not all, but most of their stuff uh, overseas certainly is logistics and supplies and things like that. It's just navies have the advantage there because as long as you're on your boat on the high seas, you can go anywhere you want, but planes eventually got to land somewhere and people, uh, these days don't really like uh, uh, combat aircraft landing there for no particular reason. Eli, what do you got? I think when, when thinking about, about BRI2, it's really important to look at how things have gone since it was first announced. Um, there are a lot of countries that are, are beginning to realize that these, I'm sorry, I think I'm getting some audio feedback. Sorry about that. Um, that they realize that, that these investments will, you know, not necessarily like debt trap, intentional debt trap diplomacy, uh, they didn't do uh, what they wanted them to do. They didn't result in, in the economic growth that they wanted or, or the infrastructure that would be more helpful for long-term economic growth. And, and so I think that as long as, you know, as someone put uh, in a comment that I overheard yesterday, as long as we keep letting them shoot themselves in the foot uh, with stuff, either, you know, unfavorable terms like that or, or continued lack of, you know, care for like real economic de development for these, you know, B uh, BRI partner countries that they're not going to be as, you know, even like, not, not that there's a PLA component, but like that, that they would be even less look at, you know, potential PLA deployments, even less, less favor. Yeah, exactly. And, and I, uh, you know, I like to remind everyone that uh, we often undersell ourselves. We are still uh, throughout most of uh, Southeast Asia, we are still the largest contributors to foreign direct investment, uh, far greater than even the Chinese. Uh, you know, we still have actual partnerships, not just loans, but actual partnerships and investments uh, across the world. Uh, and when push comes to shove, sometimes our partners and allies uh, say no to even us. Uh, and so uh, we need to be cognizant of what the Chinese are doing. We need to understand where it is, but uh, let's not oversell too much. Uh, how much, you know, buying a casino, putting in a new casino or a new soccer stadium gets you. Uh, and, uh, you know, to, to Derek's earlier point, when push comes to shove, I'm not so sure that, uh, you know, Vietnam might be perfectly happy to host some of us and let us land there from time to time. But if we're talking about a conflict with China, that's a whole different story. So uh, great points all. I want to go back. Uh, so first of all, Bianca had a question about uh, demographics. I wonder if you could uh, either in the chat or in the Q&A just kind of expand on what exactly you're talking about. Uh, demographics wise, are you talking just the people uh, or something else? Uh, and while she's clarifying that for us, uh, something back to Christina. Uh, there was a question about uh, what sparked the change uh, back in 2004, right? So in the in the change in strategic roles and responsibilities and kind of their outlook. 
was there a precipitating factor back then or was there just kind of a slow steady march and that just happened to be when it came out sure thing so um i, I recommend everyone who who has it on the you know is, who's listening in to definitely read um taylor frabel's book called active defense which came out in 2019 because he really charts kind of the, the history of this well but basically he talks about how in the mid 1980s, um, Deng Xiaoping and other leaders came to the strategic judgment um, that they no longer, uh, China no longer needed to be concerned about a the primary threat of a ground invasion from the Soviet Union to the north. Um, so I think there's like a confluence of factors here. One is that that um, um, threat was ameliorated or no longer um, a, a foundational judgment for what the PLA was supposed to be. Um, uh, organized training and equipped, you know, to, to fight. Um, and then second is that threats from, um, you know, the Eastern and kind of maritime direction uh, that would require more capable maritime and air power, um, those perceived th threats went way up. Um, so we could think about the Taiwan Straits crisis in 1995, 1996, um, where China realizes, you know, um, uh, in a potential crisis if the U.S. were to get involved, the U.S. really has a lot of military capability that um, we, the PLA, can't match. And I think this is also borne by um, uh, Chinese observation of U.S. performance in the Gulf War, um, as well as, you know, their um, later on second Gulf War and um, even in Kosovo about what is precision, high-tech um, warfare, um, you know, leveraging joint operations get you in modern warfare and it, it gets you really rapid victory um, with uh, minor losses, you know, sometimes in a matter of weeks, leveraging um, air power, maritime power, as well as, you know, rapid maneuverable, maneuverable ground forces. Um, so I think those are some of the, the things in play the mid 1990s onward. Um, the Plaf Encyclopedia talks about um, Jiang Zemin endorsing an early version of this concept um, in 1999. Um, so it's possible, um, and our, our, the book with Ken goes into this more detail, um, that it still took a couple more years to get over the hump with senior PLA leadership that actually they were going to um, increase the role for both maritime and air forces and decrease the historical predominance of the ground forces. Um, so I'll stop there. I'm sure others may have some things to add as well. No, that's perfect. That's uh, I think that exactly scratched that itch. So uh, so on the demographics, uh, one, I just want to emphasize, you know, the PLA has uh, a lot of the same similar challenges we we uh, we do in the U.S. Air Force. Uh, one of the things that you rarely see, uh, certainly in, in American media, much less in the intelligence record, are some of the challenges that they face, right? But if you pick up a copy of the Air Force Times, uh, you know, newspaper and things like that, you will always see, hey, we're, we're short on pilots, we have a recruiting problem, et cetera, et cetera, the challenges that we face. China faces a lot of those same, uh, and demographics is certainly going to be one of them. Uh, part of it is simply... Uh, you know, back in the 80s and 90s and even into 2000s, uh, you know, make this example, maybe not for the Air Force specifically, but it's really easy to take somebody with a ninth grade education, give them an AK-47, say, hey, the pointy end goes that way, uh, and off they go. That's, uh, you know, so you can recruit uh, 350,000, uh, you know, kids every, uh, every year for two years and get them into the PLA that way. Uh, that's not quite the same when you're talking, you know, stealth coding on the J-20, uh, when you're talking about some of these advanced surface-to-air missile systems and whatnot. Uh, and so the PLA is struggling to find ways to get high quality educated people uh, to both join as officers. We just saw within the last uh, week or two, uh, you know, a push to get more college grads uh, from civilian college institutions into the PLA officer corps, but also into the enlisted ranks. And that's uh, one thing that they continue to struggle with and are far, far, far behind um, the United States is in the enlisted side. Uh, and so demographics really are going to be a challenge to them. The other problem, of course, uh, you know, is we're growing up with a, a whole generation or two of single uh, single child families. Uh, and the PLA typically has not been a super lucrative uh, and until just very recently has not been a very prestigious uh, line of work unless you happen to be, uh, you know, related to someone in the Princelings and you can kind of get to some cushy jobs. But in general, um, you know, it hasn't been uh, it hasn't been what it is in the United States or or in other countries. And so, uh, if you only have one kid and you've put a lot of time and effort into getting him through high school and potentially into a college, is that really where you want to sink your your life's investment? Uh, and is that who you want to rely on for you, the parents of that one child, for going forward for 
um, you know, your, your nest egg, basically, in your retirement plan, or are you going to sink it all into this guy who wants to go and, and become a military officer? So uh, those are certainly a couple of the, the demographics challenges that uh, the PLA just kind of writ large is facing and are just exacerbated by those high tech services, especially the, the Air Force. Christina, I see you nodding along. You got some, uh, some thoughts on that as well? Yeah, one, one thing I wanted to just say um, uh, is that the retention issue might be different for the PLA and the PLAF um, specifically, um, although the PLA overall is likely to still keep downsizing a bit and the PLAF will probably take some cuts from that. Um, right now, their force um, structure is in the midst of huge changes, right? So you may have um, J more J-20s getting delivered to units while J-7s leave the force, right? These are really different types of aircraft, but you may not necessarily want to retrain your J-7 pilot um, to become, you know, your, um, you know, leading pilots for these most sophisticated aircraft that the PLA fields, right? Um, so I think that's that's one kind of interesting dynamic. Another would be, um, and I don't I don't know the answer to this, is that China's civilian aviation industry is is burgeoning, right? You know, just um, uh, you know, new um, airlines, new air routes, um, you know, massive expansion here. Um, I think uh, RAND has certainly done a lot of research about retention um, within our own Air Force um, due to competition from the commercial sector. And I kind of wonder, you know, at, at what point may this start to be an issue for the PLAF uh, and maybe plan aviation as well? Yeah, absolutely. We know that uh... Commercial airlines in China are looking to, to pull anyone in, and we actually have uh, Taiwanese retired Taiwanese Air Force pilots that go over uh, and fly for uh, commercial airlines in China. So you're right, that definitely is going to be a draw, especially as they continue to grow. All right, so we only got a couple minutes left. Uh, we got a hundred thousand dollar question uh, that hopefully everybody's had a chance to see and think about. We're going to go in reverse order. So Eli, you're going to be up first and just kind of give us your quick take. I see that uh, Derek referenced his uh, article that we put out. But uh, what is China learning, not learning, taking away from the current conflict in Ukraine? Over to you, Eli. Sure. I think, um, first of all, I, th I think uh, political comparisons to the Ukraine situation uh, are, are not the greatest thing to make. But uh, from a more warfighting operational perspective, I think that they're learning that uh, we're right to prioritize massive firepower strikes. We have to double down on that. We have to make sure we do that, and we have to do it accurate with, with some degree of accuracy, and you know, actually target key points, uh, power transmission. Um, and I think that the, they're also learning that they have to make sure that their logistic system uh, works in the first place, and is definitely going to be more survivable than than the Russians. Great, Derek. Um. I was hoping to avoid the question. Uh, so I think that uh, not to, to plug one of my hobby horses, but probably close air support. I think that one of the problems that I'm guessing, because I, I haven't followed close enough to really know, but it looks like one of the things that has hindered the Russian advance is a lack of you know, air land coordination. So I think that that really just hammers home uh, the need for that. Uh, for the Chinese. Another thing that I thought was interesting is that the Russians, when they, they began the invasion, um, I think they thought they could, you know, do it with a, a pretty light force, and they attempted air assaults against uh, Ukrainian airfields that apparently failed. Um, the Chinese have been working very hard to build their air assault forces, um, and yeah, as far as I know, the only joint training they, or combined training they've done is with the Russians. Uh, they've looked to the Russians to, to help them build that force. Um, they did some, um, they sent guys over to train with the Russians back in the end of 2019, I think. Um, now, you know, there could be a whole lot of reasons why those air assaults failed, but I think the Chinese must be looking really hard at the Russian example and wondering, you know, just like everyone else, I'm sure they're thinking, what has gone wrong here? Um, and uh, uh, yeah, that's that's another thing that I, I think of. I guess the, the only other thing I could think of is also just and make sure you got a lot of PGMs. Um, they, again, I don't really know, you know, how much stock to put into reports about what's happening in Ukraine, but uh, the PLAF doesn't seem to train a lot with PGMs. Um, 
and I'm guessing that's it's probably more of an economical uh, issue. Um, they, you know, these are expensive uh, munitions, and so, you know, I don't know if <laughs> I'm not a pilot, but um, and so maybe it's not so hard to you know guide a PGM in, and so they don't need to train with it that often, but. Um, Maybe doing more of that training, uh, more of the the uh, airline coordination with ground forces, and uh, stockpiling as many PGMs as you can is probably the one of the lessons that they'll, they'll take away. That's great. Yeah, as a pilot, uh, you always want to fire more PGMs, right? So that's a good a good thing that they're probably taking away. But those are uh, they're not cheap, right? Uh, and uh, even the PLA does not have an endless supply of uh, munitions in, in cash. Christina, over to you. Sure, I wanted to flag, you know, something that occurred to me as I was um, wrapping up the, the recent airborne um, core research I was looking at, which is, um, you know, in the um, doctrinal or theory sense, the way the PLAF talks about what the airborne forces will do. Um, you know, we looked at the Joint Island Landing Campaign, for example. Again, some of these documents are quite old, so a lot of caveats to keep in mind. Um, but, you know, they envision paradrops into you know a contested environment and you have to wonder um you know what the, the careful study of of what's go been going on in terms of the use of airborne forces or, um uh you know in the russian invasion of ukraine and and kind of more broadly you know what is the role of those for forces um in the modern era are they really that well suited for um uh, operations in a highly contested environment there's just so many risks um to forces you know uh, uh, landing, um, the transport aircraft and getting them there, um, and, and so on and so forth. So I kind of wonder um, if that will prompt um, some thinking, you know, recognizing that we don't have, um, you know, uh, really recent sources on, on how those campaigns may have been refined. But um, to me, it, it raises a lot of questions, you know, maybe um, uh, airborne forces might might be used in a variety of, of other ways, but not <laughs> to be among some of the first units in um, when there's still a lot of forces uh, available to contest them. Yeah, that's great. And I think as we continue to unfold, I know there's uh, everybody and their brother is talking about not only what's going on in Ukraine, but exactly what is Taiwan learning from it? What is the PLA, PLA learning from it? Uh, what can the U.S. take away from it? So that's a, a great question to, to finish on because uh, it's still to be determined, and I'm sure there's uh, there's lots to be written. So um, Eli, Derek, and Christina, I want to thank you very much for taking time uh, to join us today, as well as uh, all the folks that are uh, partners over at ACC. Um, we uh, we look forward to seeing you next quarter, uh, and we'll get those topics out to you shortly. But uh, for now, I want to say, uh, again, just thank you to our three presenters for this great class. Uh, and some really end up in a pretty broad ranging discussion. Um, so um, uh, thank you. Uh, and uh, we will uh, see you all again next time.